against the French and against uh, who were being backed by the Americans. The first China, you know, China war was an American proxy war with the French and their Vietnamese allies serving as American proxies. Uh, in the second Indochina war, the United States, when its proxies were about to collapse, intervened. And, and this becomes what we call the Vietnam War. It was the second of three Indochina wars. And the U.S. directly intervened with its forces, as uh, China and the U.S. had already done a decade before in Korea. Uh, the third Indochina war was in 1979. It was between uh, China and by then unified communist Vietnam. Uh, what happened, and this is a much longer debate which uh, uh, better historians than I can, can fill you in on, uh, particularly Russian and, and Chinese and Vietnamese historians, uh, the Sino-Soviet split led to a competition throughout the 60s between Moscow and Beijing uh, to uh, support North Vietnam, North Vietnam, which the North Vietnamese regime tried to prolong as long as possible, yet getting its outside sponsors competing to provide it with aid and diplomatic support and, and military aid. Uh, the Soviets essentially won this after 1968. And from that point onwards, uh, North Vietnam, which became United Vietnam in 1975, uh, became the largest and most deferential Soviet uh, ally in the world outside of uh, Cuba and Eastern Europe all the way until the end of the Cold War. And so the 1979 war between China and Vietnam was also a proxy war in a way between China and the Soviet Union, uh, the sponsor of uh, Vietnam. Uh, looking back now that the Cold War is over, we see that there were five major proxy wars which had massive death, and I don't want to minimize this, I mean, I'm using clinical language, but these were terrible, terrible, destructive things uh, involving these three powers, the United States, the Soviet Union, and China. They were the Korean War, the first Indochina War, the second Indochina War, or the uh, uh, Vietnam War, the uh, uh, third Indochina War, which had a limited number of uh, uh, fatalities compared to the other two, the one between uh, China and the so and, uh, uh, Vietnam, and the last, and uh, perhaps the most critical, the Soviet war in uh, Afghanistan, in which, as the United States had done in the Second Indochina War, the Soviet Union sent its own troops, the Red Army, in order to rescue its clients who were collapsing because of a radical Muslim movement already before they invaded, armed and supported by the United States and by China, which in the so-called Second Cold War uh, was an ally of the United States in Western Europe and Japan against the Soviet Union. Uh, so I'm not going to make the case for the uh, argument that it was a defeat. I'm just going to set it out. That, uh, but I will make this statement. I think in the year 2015, in the 21st century, half a century after the uh, U.S. abandoned Indochina, any historical account which treats the Vietnam War as a three-way conflict among North Vietnam, uh, South Vietnam, and uh, uh, the United States simply cannot be taken seriously. Uh, it was and always was a five-way conflict with three outside powers, the United States, the Soviet Union, and China, uh, playing a role along with their allies. Now, none of this is to exclude the agency of the Vietnamese people on either side. On, on the contrary, uh, there was division and dissent within both of these Vietnamese states at, at all points. Furthermore, their leaders uh, were quite adept at disregarding or manipulating uh, the advice and, and the uh, objectives of their external great power sponsors. But nevertheless, you simply cannot understand this except in terms of proxy war in Asia. The reason why the first Indochina war ended, uh, we now know from the Soviet and Chinese archives uh, in 1954, is that the Soviets and Chinese pressured North Vietnam to accept a settlement which they really resisted, but they had very little choice because uh, neither North Vietnam nor South Vietnam had a military industrial complex. It was an agrarian country. It was a, a colonial uh, agrarian society. Uh, the, the guns, the weapons, the supplies, all of that uh, for the South came from the United States and its allies, and for the North it came uh, through China and it came from uh, the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact factories. Uh, so uh, it was not inherently absurd in the 1960s 
to uh, imagine that the Vietnam War could end, as the, South, as the Korean War had, with a settlement imposed on all sides by their great power sponsors. Now, as it happened, uh, Nixon's policy of detente was a terrible failure. It achieved some goals in, elsewhere in U.S. foreign policy, but it did not achieve the primary goal of uh, getting China and the Soviet Union to impose a Geneva-type settlement on North Vietnam uh, and South Vietnam. On the contrary, uh, the Chinese and the Soviets took this as weak evidence of weakness, and they accelerated their support for the North, even as the U.S. finally, with U.S. Congress, cut off all aid whatsoever. Uh, and I can tell you there would be no South Korea today if the goal of, of the United States in the Korean War had been to create a state in South Korea that was viable without any aid, any support, any imports of military uh, uh, weapons or material from the United States while uh, either China or the Soviet Union are both supplied in the North. So uh, uh, in my view, you know, this, this is how you have to interpret this. And you can argue that the whole thing was a mistake. But I think if you're going to argue that it was a mistake, I think you have to go straight for the strategy. You have to go straight for the tripwire strategy from the 50s onwards. Uh, because I think saying that in the early 60s, any US president could have sacrificed South Vietnam without some kind of military effort. I've argued that we should have forfeited it much earlier than we did. But I do think any president would have made some effort uh, in the same way that we would not have abandoned West Berlin or Taiwan or South Korea in the 1960s in similar crises. Now, does any of this matter? To some degree, this is ancient history. Uh, I, I did the math this morning. Uh, we are as far from the Vietnam War now as the participants in the Vietnam War were from World War I. Think about that. Think about that. 1965 is as far from 1915 as it is from 2015. Uh, so, in a sense, this is ancient history, but it's a history with relevance. Uh, as we speak, the United States is engaged in two undeclared proxy wars. One in the Middle East, where it's not clear which side we're on, which is primarily a, a proxy war between uh, uh, Sunni powers, such as uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia, and uh, uh, clients and allies of the Iranians. We're also waging an undeclared proxy war in Ukraine, and we are uh, beefing up our uh, military commitment uh, to the uh, Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, uh, which, in my view, foolishly, we brought into NATO, uh, but uh, the, the administration has been making noises that NATO would be forced to go to war with Putin's Russia uh, if the US, uh, uh, if, if those states were either directly seized, like Crimea, or uh, uh, crippled or destroyed or infiltrated by the little green men that we have seen in uh, eastern Ukraine, that is by a modern version of the Viet Cong or of, of an externally state-supported uh, insurgents uh, in the Russian population. So while this particular proxy war uh, is a matter of the history books, uh, we really need to think carefully uh, about how to do this, and I think the best way to do it is to focus on the grand strategy of, for, of which these wars are a part, rather than simply looking at each one in isolation uh, and uh, uh, debating it. Thank you. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here indeed, and uh, Congratulations to David for organizing this conference, an important subject to be sure. Uh, as my contribution to this collective endeavor to reflect on the Vietnam War, I've been asked to, take, to pass judgment on two questions. One was the war all things considered morally justified, and consequently what lessons might be drawn from that judgment. I took up teaching at the Yale Divinity School in 1963, just as the debates over Vietnam policy were heating up, and I found myself in a different position from many of the critics, students, and faculty who at that time were at Yale uh, University. As a professor of ethics, I, along with other people, decided to introduce a just war approach to the analysis of the Vietnam War, 
just war tradition, as all of you surely know, uh, developed by Western Christian theologians and early international lawyers. And eventually it had, uh, in the codification sense, influence on the UN Charter, uh, the laws of uh, armed combat, and international humanitarian law. In determining whether a use of force is morally justified, it, it must meet, in the first place, six standards. Uh, it must be initiated under a legitimate authority, have a just cause, a just intent, be initiated as a last resort with a reasonable probability of success, and yield benefits, uh, sorry, yield uh, benefits, yes, that outweigh the costs. That's, at least I refer to that as general proportionality. Uh, in the conduct of the war, two additional standards must be satisfied, non-combatant immunity and a military proportionality, which is avoiding excess waste in lives and, and uh, physical material. Uh, the whole point of the doctrine is to try to provide assurance that force is being used for good reason and, above all, not arbitrarily. Ideally, all eight standards should be clearly satisfied for a given use of force to be morally justified. However, in practice, things are not usually so simple. One of the un unavoidable challenges of employing a just war approach is to decide to do uh, is what to decide to do when some standards are clearly met, other standards not, and so forth. There is no alternative, it seems to me, but to arrive at a decision as conscientiously as one can based on the application of these 10 standards and then give reasons as to why the judgment is made. Due to the limits of time and space, I shall only, in my paper, attend to four of the standards, legitimate authority, just cause, reasonable probability of success, and general proportionality. And in this presentation, I'll only deal with two of them with a quick nod to reasonable probability of success. These four, I think, are, as I look back on the debates over Vietnam, in which I was extensively involved, uh, these four refer, I think, to very salient and important central issues in the debate. Uh, in what follows, I refer to the, the three uh, standards and uh, try to show how uh, in the 60s I arrived at one judgment and after the 60s another. In short, until 1968, I defended U.S. policy as relatively just. Uh, after that period, I changed my mind, recanted, and thereafter regretted my earlier support. First, legitimate authority. There are three levels of, of attention that must be given here. One, to the legitimacy of the South Vietnamese government. Second, to the constitutional authority of the US executive to initiate a use of force. And thirdly, the international authority for such use. As to the legitimacy of the South Vietnamese government, that is a crucial part of the assessment and certainly was central in the debates that took place around Vietnam. If there was no internationally recognized boundary between North and South Vietnam, then charges that North Vietnam aggressed against South Vietnam were insupportable, and claims by South Vietnam and the US that they might exercise, quote, the inherent right of individual or collective self-defense against an armed attack, Article 51 of the UN Charter, would be unwarranted. At the time, I believe the Geneva Accords of 1954, which imposed the 17th parallel as a ceasefire boundary, and called for elections in 1956 to decide the country's future were rather inconclusive legally. The US was informed by communist authorities that there simply would be no UN supervised elections in North Vietnam, North Korea, or East Germany. 
In any case, failure to hold elections did not, it seemed to me, justify the North Vietnamese in defying the well-established UN principle that force may be employed internationally only in self-defense. The 17th parallel was widely recognized as an international boundary, analogous, as Mr. Lind has pointed out, to the 38th parallel in Korea and to the boundary between East and West Germany. Violations of those boundaries were a threat, it was assumed, to international peace and security, as the UN Security Council had explicitly ruled in authorizing a military response to North Korea's invasion of South Korea in 1950. By the way, the Paris Peace Accords signed, as you recall, in January 1973 clarified many of the legal uncertainties about the status of Vietnam and of expectations regarding the relationships between North and South Vietnam. Those accords spoke of the sovereignty of South Vietnam and mentioned that these South Vietnamese people have a right to the self-determination and that is a sacred, inalienable right to be respected by all countries. Uh, it, it also specified that the relationships between North and South Vietnam would be entered into without co uh, coercion or annexation by either party. It is, by the way, a question as to how sincere President Nixon and Henry Kissinger were either in their intention to uphold the terms of the Paris Peace Accords or in their belief that the terms would be upheld. There was a secret agreement to allow large numbers of North Vietnamese troops to remain in South Vietnam after the settlement, which, of course, threw the likelihood of upholding the terms into deep doubt. This, by the way, the intentions of Mr. K Kissinger and Mr. Nixon are certainly debated. I have to say for myself in passing that I question the sincerity of those men based upon later revelations by Henry Kissinger himself in his own memoirs. My own view is that the uh, Paris Peace Accords provided a political and moral cover for a U.S. withdrawal. What about the constitutional authority of the United States to use force in Vietnam? This centered around, of course, the debate over the Gulf of Con Tonkin Resolution adopted on August 7th, uh, 1964, overwhelmingly by both houses. It was related to skepticism, you recall, over whether certain North Vietnamese PT boats attacks had been actually T uh, undertaken or not, and that dispute became the rallying point for the legislation. But both at the time and thereafter, I myself concluded that whether the attacks occurred, they were not central. They were mentioned only in passing in the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. The burden of justification for the use of force focused on the deliberate and systematic campaign of aggression to use the language of the resolution that North Vietnam had been waging against South Vietnam at least since 1959 and probably earlier. I also agreed, uh, I also uh, concluded that the Senate uh, certainly knew what it was doing when it passed that resolution authorizing very extensive discretion on the part of the executive to use force. What about the international authority uh, to use force on the part of the United States? Um, here the arguments, of course, centered around Article 51. The problem with Article 51 of the UN Charter, the self-defense article, is that it applies to members of the United Nations, and obviously South Vietnam was not a member. Uh, the response of people like me and other international lawyers at the time was that the Korea example provides a very strong precedent of applying Article 51 to a non-UN member. Korea was divided in the same way as Vietnam. Neither of the Korean zones in 1950 was a UN member. Still, there was uh, no warrant, according to one uh, international lawyer, for holding that one zone of a temporarily divided state, whether Germany, Korea, or Vietnam, can be legally overrun by armed forces from the other zone 
crossing the internationally recognized line of demarcation between the two. Uh, South Vietnam was recognized as a separate international entity by around 60 governments and had been admitted to membership of several UN agencies. In sum, my initial assessment was that the legitimate authority of the South Vietnamese government and of the authority for use of force by the United States, both, both constitutionally and in regard to the UN Charter, was relatively well satisfied. However, during the course of the war, I began to see that the attributes of legitimacy, legitimate authority, especially in relation to the South Vietnamese government, involved more than international law. They involved additional questions of justice, which brings us to a consideration of just cause. The assessment of the just cause standard involves two issues, both of which have to do with the nature of the threat of a communist takeover in Vietnam. One, the degree and character of the local threat, that is, the damage represented by North Vietnam to the population of South Vietnam. And two, the degree and character of the international threat, the danger represented by North Vietnam to the peace and security of South East Asia and more broadly to the world at large. As to the local threat, some critics of the US policy claim that the division of Vietnam in the first place was artificial and mistaken. Speaking of a right to self-defense by one zone against aggression or armed attack by the other zone, it utterly ignores the bond of nationalism first expressed against the French and then against the US that unified all of Vietnam. Others claimed that the real threat to South Vietnam did not come from North Vietnam, but came within South Vietnam from the NLF, the National Liberation Front, the Viet Cong. What was my strategy at the time trying to argue in favor of the moral justifiability of the war? I, my strategy was to invoke respected policy skeptics like David Halberstam, making of a quagmire, also his book, Best and Brightest, uh, published in uh, 1969, and Stanley Hoffman, a colleague of mine from Harvard, who despite their skepticism, conceded what I also took to be true at the time, that a majority of South Vietnamese did not want to live under communist rule, and ideally should have been allowed freely to choose their own government. While most Vietnamese were nationalists, not all of them, the argument was, at that time accepted the communist version of nationalism. In that regard, I found support in what was revealed in the Pentagon Papers, that a war begun as a rebellion in South Vietnam against the oppressive and corrupt regime of Ngo Dinh Diem was extensively co-opted by the North Vietnamese in 1959 and to a lesser extent in 1954. There was, in short, evidence of an armed attack across an internationally uh, respected dividing line, uh, however covert that undertaking might have been. According to the experts on the Viet Cong, like Douglas Pike and others, the percentage of support for the South Vietnamese, among the South Vietnamese for the Viet Cong and LF was well, always well under 50%. As to the international threat, I grew up in the Philippines, went to high school there, and experienced the rise of the communist movement there, as well as the repercussions of the Korean War in the early 1950s. And I shared, I have to say, the fear, especially in the early 60s, over the spread of communism in Southeast Asia. Clearly, post-World War II presidents from Truman to Ford harbored the same apprehensions regarding the international threat of communism. Truman expressed the enduring official uh, US conviction that the spread of communism signaled the loss of freedom to millions of people. Now, how my mind changed. In the late 60s, I came to appreciate, and now looking back, appreciate all the more how simplistic my judgment about the war was. In determining a just cause, I concluded, 
It is not enough to identify violations against a, legal, uh, against a legitimate authority legalistically understood. If, as the official US line went, a just cause for using force in places like Vietnam was the protection against arbitrary, aggressive government as represented by the communists, then the US would have to take responsibility as a consequence of the use of force for designing and adopting policies that would secure and sustain the political, legal, and military institutions requisite for a defense of freedom. The South Vietnamese government, as one author puts it, would have to acquire, quote, a degree of legitimacy sufficient to stimulate the kind of sacrifices on the part of citizens needed for survival. This, I came to believe, the US government most assuredly did not do, thereby seriously calling into question the justice of the cause. For one thing, I came to believe that the perception of the international threat, Vietnam as the cork in the bottle, the first if it fell in a row of collapsing dominoes that would cause chaos across Southeast Asia, was exaggerated and thus blinded policymakers to the particular circumstances of the local situation in Vietnam. For example, however apposite the Korean case might be in establishing a convincing legal precedent for the legitimacy of the South Vietnamese government, the differences, as I reflected on it, far and away exceeded the similarities when it came to designing and adopting policies that effectively protected freedom. In 1969, my colleague Stanley Hoffman summarized the critical differences between the uh, Korean situation and the Vietnam situation brilliantly, I thought, and they amount to roughly the following. The Korean War, unlike the Vietnam War, was a conventional war, a textbook example of an armed attack. The unstable character of South Korean politics, headed by a clearly authoritarian leader, Syngman Rhee, could have provided grist for a nationalist revolt in the South, but the resort to invasion by North Korea removed such opportunities, rallying and consolidating South Korea society under a non-communist form of nationalism and a political system that eventually evolved into a stable, relatively open society. Kim Il-sung, the North Korean leader, was perceived as a puppet. Ho Chi Minh clearly was not. In South Vietnam, Diem might have been able to rally a non-communist version of nationalism, but he didn't. The degree of corruption, ineptitude, aloofness paved the way for the insurgency in South Vietnam and for a succession of even more corrupt, inept, and aloof governments. The military in Korea, deficient at first, developed into an effective fighting force. Arvin, that is the army of South Vietnam, never did. Indeed, the more the US intervened, the less likely it was, it was that that would happen. In sum, while the South Korean government and military turned out to be a relatively reliable client, the South Vietnamese government, in the words of Jeffrey Record in his book, The Wrong War, Why We Lost in Vietnam, proved to be a completely lousy client, to use his terms. Another way the misperception of the international threat blinded US policymakers was the failure to take note of the changing environment in Southeast Asia in regard to the spread of communism. By 1965, there had been successful counterinsurgency operations in the Philippines and Malaysia and a bloody anti-communist reform movement in Indonesia. More importantly, China was signaling to Vietnam not to act in a way that would require Chinese intervention. Since China was turning inward at the onset of the Cultural Revolution in 1966, and by 1972, China had decided to improve relations with the US as manifested in the Nixon opening. Lastly, there was growing evidence of deep friction between China and North Vietnam. In short, the image of a homogeneous, unified communist movement uh, 
uh, a great threat to all of the nations in that area was overblown, it seems to me. And rather than adjusting policy to shifting circumstances, stubborn fear of the communist threat caused the US to intensify its commitment in Americanizing the war as it did in 1965. There is the argument put forward by Mr. Lind that the U.S. had to continue to prevent, he didn't quite argue it here, you have in another essay I read, uh, namely that the U.S. had to continue to prevent a communist victory in Vietnam for the sake of international credibility. I must say I think that's a bit doubtful since seeing the U.S. bogged down in a costly quagmire, which is what, in my view, the war had become throughout the 60s, and one likely, as it did, to end in defeat was anything but evidence for credibility, it seems to me. Uh, in my third standard, I take up the reasonable probability of success. Here I'll be very brief. Uh, Jeffrey Record, in the book I mentioned, provides what I think are three principal reasons why the Vietnam War, as I came to believe, unwinnable. One, absence of a politically competitive South Vietnam. Two, overestimation of U.S. political stamina and military effectiveness. And three, underestimation of the enemy's tenacity and fighting power. Uh, the discussion of that standard in my paper will simply be commentary on Jeffrey Record's proposal. I conclude with four observations. First, the just war approach is a valuable framework, I think, for sorting out the crucial practical and theoretical considerations in judging the morality of a use of force such as the Vietnam case. The just war approach is important because attending to the moral aspects of the use of force is unavoidable. The approach is aimed at preventing arbitrary force, which as one author rightly says, I think, is a summum bonum, a supreme evil, that is, arbitrary force is. Three, the just war approach is not self-applying. It is only as good as the interpreter who uses it, and it can sometimes yield mistaken judgments. My own record in regard to the debates over Vietnam is, I think, a case in point. Uh, finally, the various standards inform each other in various interesting ways. Thanks to a more sensitive examination of the standard of just cause, I came to see that the standard of legitimate authority uh, has a, a, different, a deeper and richer meaning than I had appreciated in my earlier life as a supporter of the Vietnam War. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all, our panelists. Uh, so we have um, some time now for discussion uh, as uh, David gets wired. Uh, oh, yes. yes. Um, but I thought maybe I'd first give the panelists uh, opportunity if they had just some quick comments, uh, reactions to each other's uh, remarks, and then we'll open it up to the uh, audience. Um, yeah. Well, uh, the three choices you gave us, Michael, were, let's see, defeat, criminal, or what was the second? Mistake. Mistake. Right. Um, well, you could have a mistaken criminal war that ended in defeat. Okay. That's, that's all I wanted to say. Well, my two panelists have both uh, gone on about the corruption of the South Vietnamese elections in 1956. There has not been a free election in communist Vietnam, either North Vietnam or all of United Vietnam. I didn't say that. No, I'm, I'm pointing this out. Oh, this was yeah. overlooked. I see. Uh, in the discussion so far. So let's make this clear. No, you're right. There, uh, the, and, and Ho Chi Minh's regime did engage in some repression. Uh, I was privileged Certainly. to know Nguyen Ki Chien, great Vietnamese poet who spent almost all of his life in prison being tortured or shackled from the time he was a very young man for composing satirical poems about Ho Chi Minh, this great leader who admired uh, George Washington. So uh, now having said that, uh, we did not fight the, the Vietnam War. The U.S. did not fight this war on behalf, primarily, of the Vietnamese people. Uh, you quoted you know, that. It was just on, on the basis of our credibility. But, and, uh, 
since you've raised this, in my view, as a student of international relations, and somebody knows policymakers in many different countries, almost all wars, no matter what their other goals are, are about that country's reputation for power. So, for example, we fought in the Balkans. Uh, we said to stop genocide by the Serbs uh, against uh, uh, Albanians. Uh, you know, it is well known that uh, one of the reasons the U.S. intervened was fear that its leadership of NATO would collapse and its military credibility. That was a concern in Washington. Uh, the Falklands War over a totally worthless South Atlantic island to Britain was fought, not, as critics say, just to get Maggie Thatcher reelected. I don't believe that. Uh, it was to reassert Britain's rank as a second-rate power rather than a third-rate power. So I think this credibility question, in my opinion, to show how ecumenical I am, the Soviets were right to invade Afghanistan from their perspective. That is, if they had allowed their client state to be overthrown by Muslim extremists backed by Washington and Beijing, so I, I just, to me, all of the other criticisms you made are essentially addressing the pretexts. So I see this as a power you, struggle. Uh, the moral dimension is irrelevant to the decision making, is that what you're saying? No, there is a moral dimension, but unfortunately, I don't think it's captured by classical just war reasoning. And the reason is, in yeah. these proxy wars, in which outside powers fight a war where they try to make sure that their own people don't die, uh, the, these are terrible, terrible things. And, and there were proxy wars not just in Indochina, they were in Africa and Central America and so on. The Spanish Civil War was a proxy war between Stalin but, but Michael, and, and the fascists. But Michael, if you argue that, are you suggesting that's right? No, what I suppose people do that. What, what I'm suggesting is I think it would be very useful exercise to come up with ethical standards and legal standards for these proxy wars, which we are going to continue to have. We're having them right now in Ukraine and, and uh, the Middle East. My, but the problem is, if you, divine, if you define a just war in such exacting terms that it rules out this whole category of proxy wars, some of which you may support. I, I don't quite understand why it would necessarily rule out a proxy war. It seems to me you could subject a proxy war to the same standards and take the consequences accordingly. Well, I don't well, I think the reason that you would rule out well, some I want to, is... I want to raise one, one, yeah, a sure. different... I mean, what, you, what <clears throat> you're saying that for the sake of the United States demonstrating its military prowess, which, of course, 10 years and defeat in Vietnam didn't do a lot for that. Right. But that aside, you're saying that 3 million Vietnamese die for the sake of American credibility. Right. Now, that's right. a moral issue. Now, I understand the geopolitical argument and it's certainly one that can be made. And, but if we're going to talk about morality, then, yeah, and, and the, the Falklands War, well, that's a different, I don't want to get into Maggie Thatcher and the Falklands War. It did lead to the end of the Argentine uh, colonels, so that was a good thing. That's the one good thing it did. But no, but this, this issue of credibility, which is also what has been used over and over again since Vietnam, over and over again. American credibility is an issue in Granada, really? In Panama? You're joking. Well, I'm not and defending everything we've done. I've been critical of many of our wars. I'm sure you have. But the issue of credibility, which you do defend as a reasonable standard, seems to me about the most amoral standard one could possibly have. Well, it may be amoral. I, you know, James Joyce said, history is a nightmare from which I'm trying to awaken. I have a tragic view of world politics. Uh, I think, if, what, if, read Simplicimus uh, about the uh, horrors of, of the uh, Thirty Years' War in Germany. A third of Germans died. Yeah. The landscape was devastated. Why? Because it was a proxy war fought on German soil, largely using German Catholics and German Protestants, between the Habsburg France and uh, uh, the Habsburgs and the French monarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, now, if I designed the world, uh, these things would not exist. World politics would be quite different. You would have either the heads of state would slug it out on neutral ground, or 
to their credit, the US military hates these, these kinds of interventions. Mm -hmm. You know, the ideal war from the point of view of the military, I know their culture very well, is fighting General Rommel on the plains of North Africa after the Bedouins have all left. It's just Americans and Brits and Germans and they slug it out. And, and or else it's uh, Admiral Yamamoto versus Admiral Nimitz. So it's not like the military likes this. So I, I, I really am pained, you know, but, by, by and, and if you look at, one more point, the University of Maryland has a data set of civil conflicts around the world. Mm -hmm. They peak in two periods in the 50s, around the time of the Korean War. And then again, uh, f uh, following the Vietnam War in what is called the Second Cold War, where the US and the Soviets right. accelerate their, their battles in the Third World, and then it peaks, and then it just, boom, it falls at the end of uh, the Cold War. And the reason is, all of these conflicts would have ended quickly if one or another superpower had not kept it going. But the two superpowers kept them going. Uh, and so, to me, this is a terrible, tragic thing. So I'm not trying to okay. put well, that, that, on David, it. David, one more comment, and then we'll oh, try and open okay. the up to yeah, your right. yeah, uh, I just uh, wanted to add that it seems to me, uh, I'm not quite clear why we should exempt superpowers or great powers from doing the things they do. It, it, it sounds at times as though you're saying that's just the way they are and that's just the thing that they do. But that surely isn't going to be a very conclusive argument, is it? Because you might want to hold them to account. Well, you do, might yeah. want to invent right. humanitarian law standards, international law of combat standards, which you begin to try to hold people to account to. Why wouldn't you want to do that? No, I do want to do that. I'm, I'm a supporter of international law. Mm -hmm. I just think it has to be modernized for this post-1945, post-1989 world where if you have to jump through these hoops to say that South Vietnam is as sovereign a state as Poland was when the Germans and the Soviets invaded it, uh, then clearly this is, is propaganda, right? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it and, wasn't as... Yeah, but, it, so, but there's an interesting argument going on. Yeah, there. so so you know you need a, a international legal theory which right. recognizes something which the UN system set up in 1945, in my view, does not recognize, well. which is that there there is a de facto hierarchy of states and protectorates and satellites and so on. Uh, because we got rid of colonialism, we said that every single state is exactly the same juridically and legally. Mm -hmm. uh, and in some ways this is good, but it also means that you can't impose superior duties and responsibilities on the more powerful states as a different kind of state. Okay, let's bring uh, some of our audience members. Uh, the uh, students here have a microphone. I think Jeffrey Kimball is asking to... Oh, no, this person. Yeah, yeah there, this is addressed to uh, Michael Lynn. Uh, I wanted to uh, comment on, on your quote of McNaughton, whom I also have quoted many times. I think there's nothing in the three documents concerning credibility by uh, McNaughton that have to do with proxy wars for some Orwellian purpose in which great powers are struggling for power throughout the world. In fact, the first statement he makes is that we must be in Vietnam. I think this was 70% of the reason it was a consensus among advisors to Johnson. 70% of the reason was to protect our reputation as a counter-revolutionary force. No, he said guarantor is the word he used. Pardon? Guarantor. Guarantor. A guarantor, right. Well, Not counter-revolutionary force. Counter-insurgency. No, he said Which, guarantor. He, said he had three documents. Counter-insurgency is in there. The point is that he's talking about revolutionary war, which brings up the issue of proxy war. If there was a revolutionary war, which I believe there was, namely a nationalist war by the Vietnamese, plus a guerrilla war involving agrarian issues in the South, it doesn't quite fit your model of a proxy war. So I think if we're going to make moral judgments, we need to at least get some of the facts straight. Yeah, but more of a comment than a real question. So okay. let's, well, let's get some other. We'll be having a whole panel on this question tomorrow. Yeah. A gentleman up here. Uh, a student has the microphone there. So. 
Yeah, this is a factual question for Mr. Lind. Exactly when did the United States cut off all aid to South Vietnam? In, uh, I don't remember the, the exact Congress, date. Congress voted to yeah. after the total withdrawal yeah. of U.S. forces. Exactly when? The, well, the it U.S. Would forces be withdrew in January, March 1973. 73. So 1974. 74. 74. Cut off all aid. Oh, 74, yes. and then Congress oh, voted yes. after that. It must have been after 74. No. This is I'm untrue. Not sure. Congress reduced the yeah, aid no, in the last year of the war in 1974. There was never a complete cutoff. Well, okay, the answer to that it is... It makes a big difference. Well, no, it doesn't, because, look, I agree with, I agree with uh, Dr. Little. Look, the war was lost by 1968 when American public support has collapsed. Uh, I, I agree with the interpretation that the Nixon version of the war was a long attempt to extricate the U.S., while saving face, again, for credibility. We went to war for credibility, then once we fail, we try to extricate ourselves for credibility. As, as I, that was the point of my, uh, about South uh, uh, Korea. Given the material support reduced or cut off uh, without U.S. military support after 1973, it was well known that essentially the United States was writing off the South Vietnamese regime, right? To this day, the United States is prepared to go to war in an hour if South, Vietnam, if South Korea, Korea is attacked, right? So the outcome of the war in the Korean War was to leave U.S. troops there, leave bases there, and so on. So in my view, and, and the South Korean regime being that much more popular than the, uh, the North Vietnamese, I don't know. South Korea was a very nasty dictatorship up until the end of the Cold War. They used something called Korean barbecue, was a form of torture used on them. So we actually don't know whether there could have been a viable South Korea if the U.S. had pulled all of its troops out and minimized support for it. Uh, but that's what we were claiming in South Vietnam, and I think it was just a cover for what was, in fact, a U.S. withdrawal. The fact is the United States withdrew military force from Vietnam. The United States did not cut off military aid to South Vietnam. No, we cut, we, we cut Never. Off, we, okay. we did cut off military aid. No, okay. I, this man knows the answer. Ed Maurice yeah, knows the answer knows. right okay. there. Well, I'd also like to ask a question, but Please. Uh, it, it, the United States military aid to South Vietnam ceased when the shelling of Tan Son Nhut Airport became heavy enough so it was physically impossible to continue the delivery of aid, and had the shelling waited another 24 hours before closing Tan Son Nhut Airport, more aid would have arrived. That's right. Uh, but to ask an actual question, uh, Dr. Lind, it seems to me that Mister. <laughs> uh, you are, when you talk about proxy relationships, you do not appear to make any distinction between an outside power which sends in its own armed forces to fight in a war.